certainly an honor for me to be here this afternoon with you and to get to share a little bit of, of my story since my time at DU, really. And I'm wearing this hat right now um, to support the DU hockey team this evening in their game. And I'm a hockey fan. I love DU hockey. I always have. I went to high school in Evergreen. My sister uh, came to DU first, and I think that's the only reason I actually got into the school was because I had a, a sister who was here before me, and everybody loved her. So we thought, well, if her brother is anything like she is, uh, we might as well let him in. Well, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not as smart as my sister. I'm not as good looking as she is, but somehow they still let me in. Um, but I wish this hat was a DU ski team hat. I'm proud of the fact that this team has such a legacy that they've won so many national championships. And the memories I have of DU were uh, of being a part of the ski team. Of course, when I was here, it was a club team. And one of my friends, Tom, is here today too, and he was also a part of that program. And the last time that I was able to share a space with the chancellor was with that club team. And we got him in a headlock and said, you've got to make this program a varsity team again. <laughs> Now, I'd like to think I had some part to play in that and was responsible, but uh, that's not really the case. It was the team, and it was the guys who were really the leaders on that team um, who instigated that. And DU then did bring the uh, Division I ski team varsity program back, and uh, it's just neat to have been a part of that tradition and to see them go and, and succeed. But really, I think what I learned through that process is uh, a way, of, a way of thinking and a way of being. And I, I learned that here at DU, both in the sports programs as well as um, the extracurricular activities and certainly in the classroom, that uh, it is all about ascending and having that kind of mentality and that kind of attitude to be looking ahead, to be setting goals, to be forging a trail, pioneers, going someplace where people haven't gone before. And it's that kind of fortitude and that kind of mentality um, that my experience here at DU really gave me. Maybe even more than the technical skills and knowledge that the things I would learn in the class, it was kind of a, a way of being. I, I, I was in the geography program as part of environmental science and would spend some time in biology too. And I had these wonderful, incredible professors that uh, took us students in kind of like their own kids and family. And we would travel the West together we hiked to the Grand Canyon, we'd spend time in the car, we'd sit around campfires. Uh, we were a rowdy bunch, and I don't know how our professors ever put up with us, but uh, they were amazing guys. They took us down to Belize on a tropical ecology class. You guys remember that one. <laughs> and uh, it was risky business to take us down there. But uh, because they were willing to take those risks, I think I learned way more than I ever could have in a classroom. And I think DU has that kind of spirit about it, to look at things differently, to take risks, to take chances, to go out and do things that I think other schools may not really do or, or encourage. And so I, I'm grateful for where that has led me. Well, I guess really that's led me around the world on climbing expeditions. That's what I pretty much do full time. I climb, I get to speak about it, but I also get to work with a lot of different nonprofits and I get to work with uh, youth and adults that have different disabilities. I've been to South America where I've trekked the Inca Trail. I did this with nine blind high school students. 35 miles we trekked. Well, these nine blind students had the scariest part of that trip was that they had nine sighted high school students as their guides. <laughs> so you could imagine what that would be like. Well, the thing that was really interesting is it took them both out of their element and they had to develop this special trust and this special bond to get each other down the trail. I was there to really to just give them the tools and kind of teach them how to make this work and they were the ones that got themselves down the trail to that final destination, that ancient city of Machu Picchu. After this trip, four of them said, this isn't enough, this is just the beginning. It kind of opened their eyes, so to speak, to possibilities. And four of them came up with their white canes and tapped me on the shoulder as we headed out. And they said, we'd like to go climb Kilimanjaro. What do you think? Well, a year later, I saw four of those blind students stand on the roof of Africa. It's been extraordinary. These experiences have really changed them, but they've also changed me and the way I see things and my perception of things and what I see as possible. And I think I owe a lot of that to 
the education and the start that I got here at the University of Denver? Well, the larger the obstacle, um, I believe, the more we have to learn, the more we have to gain from achieving that goal. Well, there's no, in the mountaineering, there's no larger obstacle than the Himalayas. I would set off to go and climb Mount Everest with a good friend of mine, Eric Weinmayer, who lives here in Golden, who's completely blind. And by his invitation, we would go and try this, even though people were saying to us, that's impossible. You don't belong. They would tell Eric, you're going to die. And they would tell me, he's going to take you with him. And our response to that was, well, that's great, mom and dad, but uh, <laughs> really, I think we do have what it takes. These were, the, these were not just people close to us, but it was the elite Himalayan veterans that were quick to criticize. They were the experts, but they were not the experts on us. We were pioneers. We were doing something that hadn't been done. We believed in ourselves and we believed in the possibilities. I think so many times we, we get caught up in, in hearing those voices of others and we think, you're, maybe you're right, maybe I shouldn't, but we had the skills, we had the team, we had the experience, everything we needed to take that step. Well, we would go and do a training climb and from these experiences, as well as from my time here at DU, the things that I've learned is that you have to be courageous if you're going to be a pioneer. You have to have the courage not only for yourself to take that step, but as I learned from my professors, as they so often selflessly did to me, and that is they had the courage to serve. And that's what we need, to look beyond ourselves and our own selfish ideas and ambitions and have the courage to serve, to, to see others succeed and to go forward, to have faith and trust in those around us, to have team spirit, which is basically teamwork elevated to the next level takes that engine which is just idling and working fine, which is teamwork, but puts it in gear to move it down the road. That's team spirit. It would take uh, leadership and integrity. And then, of course, perseverance, the ability to press on towards that goal which we had established. Well, we'd push ourselves there to the Himalayas to climb this first mountain called Amada Blom. You can see it on the right-hand side of this picture. Steep and technical, high and demanding. I'd be there with my blind friend guiding him up the mountain. The team had, had moved ahead of us and established camp. And so when we get to this final obstacle here called the Yellow Tower, just before our high camp, uh, my friend is scanning the wall, reading it like a chalkboard with his hand running over. It's kind of blank at this one moment. Thousands of feet of exposure beneath him. And he says, what now? <laughs> well, uh, there's a hold there. You just got to reach up six inches and out four. Trust me, it's there. <laughs> All right, Whew. boom, he gets it. And like that, we move up over the edge. When we arrive, we can see that camp is set up. Teamwork, all right, they had to carry the heavy loads, you know, I, I like this. Well, I arrive at camp with my blind friend and hey, this is cool, where's our tent? To which the team replies, you guys will be right over there. Ah, I don't know if you can see that too clearly in the back, but that's on the edge of about a 2,000 foot fall. Hmm. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking probably what you are thinking, and that is, my tent mate's blind. He can sleep on the left. <laughs> well, he's a little quicker than I am, a little smarter. He took the right-hand side, put his stinky underwear all over it, and uh, I wasn't about to touch that, so I got the room with the view. As we climbed in, uh, uh, the team went back down to base camp 5,000 feet below. When they got down, a storm came in, and it pinned us together in this tent for six days. 20,000 feet in the Himalayas with a blind climbing partner in the middle of a storm. Not a lot you can do, except really get to know each other perhaps better than you really ever wanted to. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, I know you're, you finished lunch, maybe you're working on dessert, but uh, every time I, I get to share with a grade school, a high school, they all have that question. It's not how do you cook. <laughs> You know, uh, maybe, uh, well, I'll just let the pictures do the talking. This is my friend doing a bombing raid over Nepal. <laughs> I just fig figured I'd save you the embarrassment of asking that question. <laughs> well, the team came up, they, they saw what we had been doing, <laughs> which was pretty much nothing, and we gave it one final effort to get to the top. It was difficult. The mountain was in a, a terrible condition, snow and ice all over it. We gave it our best effort. And then we decided it was time to turn around. 
an incredibly difficult decision because in our culture, you know, even at school, success is defined by the results. It's your grades, it's the job you get maybe afterwards, it's the money you make in climbing, it's standing on the summit, it's planting that flag, and well, we were not gonna make the summit. We were gonna have to go back and face those naysayers. But I thought of, of our success differently in this moment, and that this expedition was an incredible success. We learned to climb well together. We, le we learned how to function as a team. And then when it really mattered most, we learned how to make that difficult decision, to not let our pride get in the way of our decision making. We, we learned how to communicate through that process. And more important than anything, we maintained our relationships, our friendships, and we turned back. It was a successful expedition. One person did summit that mountain that year. That one person lost all 10 of their fingers. I'd say it was a great success. Well, we turned back, and on the way down, I was getting, approaching my tent, which was perched on the edge of a 600-foot cliff this time. And I had to unclip from the fixed lines and make a few final steps towards my tent. And as I did so, the snow under the rocks, something caused this rock, which I had stepped on before, to slip underneath me. I fell down, I landed on that rock, and then I began to slide over with it in my arms, over that edge, into the abyss of that 600-foot fall. I realized if I didn't let go of this rock, it would crush me as I fell. So I, I let go and tried to grab the, the edge, but my gloved hands just went poof, off that powdery ledge and I, I began to plummet. I'm often asked, well, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, as if you can just pause in midair and really reflect on things. I was thinking what anyone would be thinking, and that is, do these pants make me look fat? <laughs> no, it's more like four letter words. Things like, help, <laughs> stop, <laughs> grab was another one. There might have been one or two others, but I can't remember what they would have been. Well, I began to fall, and I had the good fortune of bouncing off a few rock outcrops on the way down, and 150 feet uh, down, I, I stopped on a ledge about the size of this podium. Just poof, came to a stop, had my eyes closed, and I thought, I was going to open them and see angels. Instead, I looked up and I saw my three teammates <laughs> looking down at me. While they threw a rope down, I was able to climb back up and meet them. And uh, my first teammate, this guy from Alaska, had this gnarly goatee, kind of like yours, but he had less food in his. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm kidding. He had more. <laughs> That's, yeah. When he would talk, that food would shoot out, though, and you could get a snack if you were quick. But he looked at me and he said, dude, I thought you were a goner. And then he walked off. And, Oh, how about a hug? <laughs> My other teammate, kind of in his 50s, a throwback to the 60s at the time, said all I could say was, whoa, man, stop. <laughs> My other teammate said, I just started praying for you. And to me, it was though, as though I really landed in the hand of God. And though I don't claim it to be a miracle, I'll say I think it was divine intervention. I climbed up into, into my tent uh, with a rope they threw down, and I'll make this long part of the story short. I ended up getting high altitude pulmonary edema. I wasn't able to get on, off the mountain under my own strength. I had to rely on the doctor and his guidance and help to get me down off the mountain. I, I got lower and was put into this thing here called the Gamoff bag. It's a, a, a chamber that's pressurized and it simulates a lower elevation and it can force that fluid back into your lungs. I was pretty much really about to die at this moment, and I needed help. And talk about having the courage to serve. There was one helicopter pilot there in Nepal who said, I'm going to fly up there in spite of the storms, which are still lingering. Nobody else would do it. And at first, he even said he wouldn't do it. Well, my life depended on it, and this guy was willing to risk his for mine. He flew up. My knees were black and blue from the amount of praying I was doing as well as the amount of spitting up of things of wonderful color <laughs> that I was doing. But this guy flew up. The sky opened up over base camp. That helicopter landed. I ran out, got in, we took off, and then 10 minutes later, that sky closed up behind us. Really kind of the, the second little miracle of, of my adventure here, which as I flew out, I thought certainly was over as quickly as it began that I was a loser, that this team would never have me back to go and climb Everest, which had been a dream of mine since, since I was a kid. Now that first picture that you saw while you were eating lunch was a poster I had in my room and it said, Ascend. 
climbing Everest had been a dream of mine since I was a boy. And I know the university has that campaign ascend for raising funds and um, getting people on board with the purpose and the future of the university. And my dad brought that poster home one day and he hung it up in our home and I would just sit there and stare at that thing and I would think about the possibilities and myself wanting to ascend. Well, in this moment, it was over. I thought there was not a chance. I got home and I spent a lot of time with my best friend, a guy named Joseph. Joseph was a huge supporter. He was the kind of friend that I would hope all of us at some point in our lives would have. I'm fortunate that my wife is a lot like Joseph and that she believes in me more than I believe in myself. Well, my friend Joseph died in a snowboarding accident uh, two months before I went to climb Everest. I was the one that found him the next morning with his snowboard facing up at the bottom of a cliff uh, in the deep snow, he had suffocated and died because he had gone snowboarding by himself into the backcountry. Well, I went to his memorial service and what I saw in his yearbook were these words. His plans were to make a difference in the world around me. Next to his name, when asked other people, they had other statements as to what they were gonna do with their lives and they were fine. I'm gonna go to college, I'm gonna get this job, I'm gonna work on this career, the, kind of the standard answers, but his really stood out to make a difference in the world around me. He encouraged me to go back to Everest and it was this picture that I laminated and put in a pocket and took with me after I had made that decision to go back. It was fear and doubt that were keeping me from wanting to go back, but it was the inspiration of my friend that allowed me to take that step in spite of my grief. I got a, a t-shirt, uh, actually a set of t-shirts for my little girls that uh, say I'm gonna change the world, a future pioneer. And I think it's, it's that same kind of outlook that it's not really about me, it's about serving others. And I think that's the spirit of pioneers is it's paving a way for others and seeing the possibilities for others. Well, that's one of the things I learned here that's kind of the people that I've been fortunate to have in my life, like my friend Joseph. And it, that's what enabled me to take that next step to then go back for the climb of a lifetime. I would lean heavily on that friend support, but then heavily also on my faith. And these a couple of scriptures here uh, really stood out and meant a lot to me. This one, it says, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. The next one really dealt with my fears, and it says, to be strong and courageous, to not be terrified. Well, I was terrified the first time I saw Mount Everest and my knees were shaking, especially thinking of taking a blind person there. People die up there, strong people die up there with all of their senses. What would we be thinking to be taking one who's missing a vital one of his? Well, we'd be trekking in and as we would be going up to base camp, we'd be crossing over a lot of these suspension bridges and we're working our way down narrow trails and we had two other blind guys with us. We called them our alternates in case Eric fell in a crevasse. <laughs> They didn't think that was too funny, but they called themselves the three blind mice. Well, two of the mice were pretty, pretty new at this whole deal, and then there was Eric, who'd been doing this for a lifetime, and he's plugging away, you know, cranking with his poles. He knows right where rocks are. He can hear where trees are. He's got this amazing sonar ability, and he's just going down the trail with us. And uh, the Sherpas, who are very much a part of our team, they, they think, they're up to some sort of hoax here. I, I, don't, I don't think he's blind. Those guys are blind. This guy, I'm not so sure. And so it began to divide the team. We said, Eric, you gotta do something. Tell these guys your story. So that night around the dining tent, high in the Himalayas, you know, the wind's kind of pushing on the tent. The candles flickering on the table. Uh, the Sherpas are sitting there waiting for him to come in and tell his story with a box of tissues, you know, for the tears. And uh, Eric walks in and we go, okay, great, here we go. And instead of really saying anything, he just goes, pulls out his prosthetic eyes. <laughs> looks around the tent, <laughs> pops them back in. <laughs> the Sherpas, instead of, uh, you know, sobbing and crying, they instead <laughs> say, please do not do that again. <laughs> we believe you. After that, we're a cohesive team. They go to his tent the first thing in the morning. Here's your tea, you know, and uh, let me help you. Let me take your bag and boom, there we go down the trail. It took a little bit of innovation, a little creativity. <laughs> And I think walking in, in someone else's shoes, at that point they could then realize what it was 
uh, to be blind and what it would take. And I, I would need that as well to be creative and to you know, blaze this path to be a pioneer uh, in terms of climbing. A blind person had never attempted Everest. I had to put myself in his shoes, think about what it's like to be blind and better then describe the terrain and the surroundings and get him up the trail. Well, thankfully, it's not walk a mile in someone else's pants. Who else would wear pants like this but someone who can't see pants like this? <laughs> We'd made it to base camp, and now the climb would really begin as we'd go up through the Kumbu Icefall, this river of ice that comes down off the mountain. It crushes people, it kills people as they ascend the mountain. It's a dangerous place. It would take us hours to get through there, 13 hours on our first attempt, and we thought that was going to be it. But we persevered, we kept pushing on, and it would take us five efforts of acclimating and shuttling loads to get up this mountain before we would summit. Two and a half months on this mountain we would spend. And in that time, I would see what courage was all about. I would see my friend display this courage. It's defined as facing danger with confidence and control. I think a better definition is it's that which propels us in the presence of our fears. I have a little video clip that I want to show. I want you to consider yourself and maybe some fears and some things that you might be facing uh, in your lives, some challenges. And do you, are you, do you have that good team around you of support? to help you to take that step. Well, put yourself in these shoes. You're at 19,000 feet, you're completely blind, and you're stepping onto the cheapest ladder that money can buy. We have to tell him where every step is or he has to feel every step. It's just, we have to be his eyes. He has no eyes. This is a three-section ladder over a big crevasse. Thing is, uh, I, I never practiced it with one rope. Okay. No, there's two ropes in this one. Oh, okay, good. And it leans to the left, the ladder. Oof. Okay? I may crawl across it. I just don't want to fall. No, you're good, man. But if I fall, though, I'll just dangle in that space, right? A little slack on that, baby. Okay, now take a big step to your left. So these lines will be tight. You guys will keep them tight. All right, so left foot is left foot. You'll just slide the ascender on the rope. Right. And then lean back. Yeah, I feel it. It's narrower than the ones we have. Let's fall into that. And if anything happens, just take a big deep breath, right? Because you always are watching this. You want to watch those seals in. Right. Like that. Sometimes people assume that if you can't see how far you have to fall, you're not afraid. But I sometimes think that falling into the unknown is scarier than falling into something you can see. How's that? Put that foot. Put that foot inside. 
Well, the chancellor thought it would be fun as part of the alumni weekend and homecoming weekend if we would put some ladders up on the roof. And so we did so. And in order to leave the lunch today, I'm sorry you got to cross the ladders. <laughs> keep, your, keep your napkins. That'll be your blindfold. And uh, we'll have a lot of fun. But you can see what I mean by my friend and, and having that kind of courage. For me, when I first saw those, there's about 50 ladders like that as you would climb this mountain. When I saw that first one, I thought, no way. And the fear welled up inside of me. And then I turned my focus off of me and onto my friend. And the next thing I, I knew, I was across that ladder, almost doing it backwards, just thinking of him. And it made me think that how often that's true in our lives. When we take the focus off ourselves, we focus on somebody else. We have that courage, not just for ourselves, but to serve. Our own fears kind of fade away. And we can get through those situations so much more effectively. <laughs> and well, not quite fearlessly, but uh, certainly get to the other side. Well, it's built on relationship, which is trust. It's reliance, commitment, and confidence. My friend knows that uh, he can rely on me. We've built that over time. And therefore, he knows that I'm committed to him. Whether a storm comes in or a ladder collapses, I'll be there by his side to help him through. And it was that kind of team spirit that we all had, focused on others, not on ourselves, maximizing our individual strengths. I think we'll see that tonight in the hockey game. These guys using their individual skills, but for the good of the team to beat Michigan State. It's cooperative. It has that common goal. That's what made this team so special, allowing us to climb higher. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can pick him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Well, we'd cross a few more ladders, and then we were well on our way. This one here was called the Jesus Ladder. We had nicknames for different places on the mountain. This one was called this because it was the first word out of my teammate's mouth when he stepped on it. <laughs> well, we'd get over that, we'd continue on to camp two, and then it's the Lotsey face you can see in the distance there, a 3,000 foot wall of ice. We'd camp halfway up that, and then it's on to camp four at 26,000 feet. From there, all that lies ahead is that final trip to the summit. Well, we'd established camp at 26,000 feet, a place that's called the death zone. You can't survive there for long, even with supplemental oxygen your body just really starts to metabolize itself and it can't assimilate nutrition and so you're essentially dying. You put on that oxygen and you hope your time there is limited. As we got to that camp, we set up our tents, we, we realized that uh, it was not gonna be our summit day. We were gonna have to spend one extra day and one extra night there. Well, that night we heard word that an Austrian climber had fallen to his death and then a Russian climber to his death. A Spanish climber went missing. Our tent was about 100 feet from the body of a Sherpa who had died years before. His body perfectly frozen, perfectly preserved and frozen there in that place. The doubts really began to fill our minds once again and we looked at each other, our teammates, with kind of laser beam <laughs> eyes, wondering, if, can I trust you one more day? Well, just in the middle of our doubt as we're wondering what to do next and can we take that next step, a guy, a leader from another expedition comes over uninvited. It's dark outside, the wind is blowing. He didn't really know who was in this tent and he unzips it. He pokes his head in. He's from uh, Great Britain, I wanna say Scotland or Ireland and he's got these chapped cheeks and bloodshot eyes and cracked lips and snot coming down his nose and just really kind of a, an ugly picture. And then he pokes his head in and he goes, you guys, you're gonna have a hell of a time getting a blind guy up there. <laughs> and then he walks off, oh. It's like a little leprechaun just came and peed in your lucky charms. <laughs> okay, as if it wasn't bad enough. And then you just start, you, I feel my fingers, I feel my toes, I'm thinking clearly. 
You check in with your team. And the next thing we knew, 9 o'clock at night, without really uttering a word, we had the plan down pat, stepped out of our tent, and made our way towards the summit. In that single file line, we worked our way up. Our team doc said, this is my summit here. I've got a wife and kid at home. I'm going to stay behind. A couple hours in, I see a lamp up near the front come back down and loop his way to each teammate and give each teammate a hug. And he gets to me, he lifts his goggles, and he's got a tear in his eye. It's our team leader. He said, I got nothing left. I got to go back. I thought, this is it. He's going to turn this whole team around, one of the strongest climbers on our team. Instead, he said, you guys have what it takes. Go for it. Stand on that summit. I think that's what a university is really all about, is encouraging others, pushing others to get beyond maybe even a place that you have made it yourself. I think as alumni, that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing too. We're still leaders. And that is to see others come up and get beyond and achieve more than we ever thought possible, even for ourselves. And I'm thankful for, uh, for the staff and the, the faculty that were here at the school who, who saw the potential in me that I didn't see and encouraged me to go beyond. They had a pioneering spirit and a pioneering heart, and they were willing to give it away. Well, I think the team leader on this expedition had that when it mattered most. He was able to step aside and say, you keep going, continue on. Leadership, it's having vision. But it doesn't stop there. You act on it. And then you believe, and you take those steps. That's exactly, in that moment, what I learned about leadership. Well, we climbed through a whiteout where, at a point, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. The guy behind me said, I haven't seen mine in 20 years. What's the big deal? <laughs> we climbed through the darkness, through the whiteout, and finally, the sun, well, the, the whiteout gave way to the stars, the stars to the sun. And, we couldn't really feel the heat from it at that altitude yet, but we felt that warmth of hope that it offered. Enough to take one more step to the south summit, to look across this ridge where it's 6,000 feet down on the left and 8,000 feet down on the right. So if you fall, fall left. <laughs> we'd walk across this ridge, I'd be with my blind friend and we'd be working our way, it's a knife edge, and get to the Hillary step, pull on these ropes, and I would see that it's all about perseverance. So many opportunities to turn around even before this trip began. But sticking, sticking to it, sticking to that purpose for which we started, that's what perseverance is. It's having a passion for what it is that you do, a willingness to take a risk. And then the, the mental stamina to persist in it. With that, we persevered because of our passions, to see each other, not just ourselves, stand on top. And then we made it to the top of the world, a team that set five world records, a team that's been called the greatest team to ever climb Everest. We were the ones that were supposed to go down in flames. Eric was supposed to die, but yet somehow we pulled it off. Well, I think it was because of a pioneering spirit and a belief in each other, supporting each other more than the individual. The blindest man in the world, as the Sherpas called him, the blindest man in the world. The largest team, 19 of us, stood up there that day. The largest camera. The oldest man, Sherman Bull, it was his fifth attempt. He said, I didn't plan on being the oldest man, I just got old trying. <laughs> and then the first American father and son. We stood up there for just a few minutes and it was time to get down as the weather was building. And as we headed down, we could hear some clinking and someone coming up from the north side. We looked over our shoulders, and I don't know if this picture, you'll be able to determine who that is, but he's such a humble guy, you'd never know it. We turned around, and there he was. <laughs> DU's very young. Chancellor Kuhn was up there, so look, look at his hair. It's not even out of place. He had a much easier go of it than we did, but uh, you didn't know that about him. Uh, same day, so pretty incredible. I should be proud of him. My friend made the cover of Time magazine, and I, of course, am not bitter or jealous or angry about the fact that I'm standing right there. <laughs> I just happened to get cropped out of that one photo. That's okay. And all expense paid to Disneyland is how we got to celebrate. Very special. Also special was a trip to the Oval Office to meet the president at the time, uh, something that was really a great honor. 
And another honor was to be in New Zealand climbing and then to be able to go to the house of Sir Edmund Hillary and spend a day with him just talking about climbing and philanthropy as well. Uh, so to be with two pioneers right here, two of my heroes and one of my good friends, uh, really a, a great day. To be here this afternoon to share with you, I'm, I'm humbled. Um, my endeavors have taken me around the world in a, in a different way, doing, doing something very unique. And I know that the people in this room have gone off to accomplish great things, far greater than I could probably imagine. So I'm humbled to be able to stand here and to share with you this afternoon. And if I could encourage you in any one way, it's to maybe not let your perceptions get in the way, to certainly not let pride cloud that vision for what it is that you want to do, to surround yourself with people you trust, to have courage, to look ahead and, and pioneer again, to keep taking steps forward, to be leaders of integrity, to never give up, to persevere, and then to ascend. I love that, the, that DU has chosen that word uh, as, as a part of this endeavor, to ascend, because it's always looking up, always looking forward, always looking ahead to the possibilities. I've been able to author a book. I called it The Summit, Faith Beyond Everest Death Zone. I've got copies here. The, the bookstore was kind enough to, to provide some. If, if you're interested, I'd be in the back to answer questions and, and sign some of those. Uh, one of the questions I always get, we're going to do a, a little bit of a QA and a here, I think, if we have time still, um, is, is what's next? Well, I haven't done a whole lot of climbing the last four years because I had twin daughters. And uh, that's been a, a whole climb in and of itself. Harder than any other mountain I've ever been on. <laughs> Much more challenging. I'd say 10 times more so than Everest, but uh, also 10 times more rewarding. Uh, what's next for me is next month I am going to go up to the Arctic and run a marathon with polar bears. You've heard of the running of the bulls? <laughs> this will be the running of the bears. This might be the last time you see me, so uh, <laughs> it's been real. Uh, I had a, an invite. It's just kind of a, a special select group. We're going to go up there and, and run this. And the real interesting thing is that it's my first marathon. I think I know why I was invited. You don't have to be the fastest, just not the slowest. <laughs> so they're hoping I'll be the slowest, I think. Anyways, thank you so much for letting me have this space to share with you this afternoon. It's been truly an honor and a joy. Thank you.